Well, I don't know about you, but it has been so good for me to get back into these personal petitions that we're talking about during this series. Uh, Ten petitions that I've lifted up to the Lord probably more times than almost any others over many years. Things I come back to, and they're simple, they're just short, but things I pray and long to be true in my own life. And But each one of them could be a whole series, right? And some of them have been whole series in the past, but we're taking this series to just spend one day on each of these and uh, we're making available a resource that our team has put together that will help you make this a year of praying through these petitions. So there's a booklet that has scripture in it that you can relate to uh, these prayer requests. It's based a journal, some making it personal questions. I love those kinds of questions. Well, I don't always love them. Uh, I don't always like answering them. I like asking them, uh, but I need to answer them. So, so, so what? about this truth. How do you make it personal in your own life? How does it apply? And we really try and do that here at Revive Our Hearts. So uh, scriptures that you can pray back to God in these areas. And that booklet is available along with a set of cards that have these 10 petitions written on each of the cards. The cards are identical, but it's a set so you can share one or two with a friend, uh, but also so you can put these cards in different places and be reminded to pray these things. Pray them not only for yourself, but if you're married, these are great things to pray for your husband. Uh, these are great things to pray for your children, maybe kids away at college or grandchildren, uh, to pray for your pastor, to pray for your church, that first in our own hearts, and then God will, that God will use us as instruments to see these things happen in other hearts. So the, uh, those resources are available, that uh, personal petitions pack, we're calling it, uh, is available for a donation of any amount. And when you give to the ministry of Revive Our Hearts, you're helping this message reach into the hearts and the homes of women across the United States and around the world, helping them find freedom and fullness and fruitfulness in Christ. So this isn't just purchasing some resources, uh, but this is investing in this ministry and in other women's lives. And our way of saying thank you for that investment this month is to send you that personal petitions pack. Also, if you've missed any of the earlier programs in this series, there are transcripts and audio available that you can go back and pick these up. And so we've talked about the first six, guard my heart, fill me with your love, fill me with your spirit. May I be clothed in humility? Or as I tripped up and said the other day in a recording session, humidity. I meant humility. I don't want humidity. I do want humility. And number five, make me a servant. That flows out of a humble heart. And then another thing that flows out of a humble heart was number six, give me a grateful spirit. And then today we come to one, this is tough, uh, because it's so convicting. Every time I read the scripture on this subject, I get onto this subject. It's a heart issue, but it affects a lot of people around us. And that's the prayer request, guard my tongue, guard my tongue. Proverbs 18 says it this way, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so, Lord, before I say anything else to these women, I just want to speak to you for a moment in their presence and realizing that death and life are in the power of the tongue. I pray for words that will honor you and that will edify the women in this room today and those who will listen through the radio and the podcast in days to come. Pray that the words of my mouth right now, and even more importantly, what only you see and know, the meditation of my heart, may it all be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and our great Redeemer. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Words have power. Our words are powerful, and they have consequences. They have the power to cut, to wound, to crush, and even to kill and destroy. They can kill a relationship. They can kill a friend's spirit. They can kill someone's reputation or their future. They can destroy a community, a church, a workplace, a family, a marriage. All of us at one time or another, I'm sure, have experienced the devastating effect of harmful words. It may be in some of your cases something that someone said to you when you were a child 
four, five, six years of age, and you still have those words playing, that record, if you remember what records were, <laughs> playing in your head, it's stuck with you for decades, and you can't seem to shake it. You can't seem to break free from it. It's the power of words. Death is in the power of the tongue. But I want to just hasten to say we're not just victims of other people's words. Who among us has never spoken words that have wounded the spirit of a friend, a child, or a mate? Now let me also say that words not only have power to kill, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Words have power to give life, to heal, to nourish, to restore, to bless, to strengthen, to encourage. And of course, that's what we want to be true with our tongues. Let me encourage you as you're praying through this request in 2016, I hope it's going to be a recurring prayer, to at some point or another go through the book of Proverbs. Now, there are other passages where you could do this, but Proverbs is where you have a lot of concentrated emphasis on practical Christian living. And the tongue is one of the topics that's emphasized in Proverbs. And just list the different types of words that it talks about in Proverbs and the effect that those words can have on others. So we have words that bless and give life, and we have words that kill and destroy. Go through and make a list. You could do that in this little journal, um, that uh, the, the uh, personal petitions pack. You could make some notes in there or just in your own journal. And let me just say also we have a couple of additional resources that we'll link to at reviveourhearts.com. We have a four-week study called The Power of Words. It's a study in the book of Proverbs of the tongue. And then we have another entire radio series we recorded some years ago that's just Proverbs on the tongue. And so those will be linked to on our website. You want to do more study and dig into this more? I think this is a topic as women we need to come back to over and over and over again. And doing just this one program has been so good for me and it's made me want to get back into some of those other resources. You see, I said that our tongue, that our words, this is a heart issue, and that's because our speech is a barometer. It reveals our hearts, our true spiritual condition, because as Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when I say something, I'm going to go, oops, I didn't mean that. Mm -hmm. The fact is, at some level, I did mean that. Now, I may be sorry I said it. <laughs> Sorry it came out, but what I'm really saying is it was in my heart, and I'm just sorry you heard what was in my heart. We don't like seeing what's in our hearts, and it comes out of the mouth. You see this connection between a wicked heart and wicked words many times in the Scripture. Let me read you a few verses. Psalm 36, verse 1. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There's no fear of God before his eyes. Verse 3, the words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. So he's got a wicked heart, and what comes out are wicked words. Psalm 64, hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the throng of evildoers who wet their tongues like swords, who aim bitter words like arrows, shooting from ambush at the blameless. See, the wicked heart uses his tongue as a sword, as arrows to shoot at those they want to wound. Psalm 109, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me. Speaking against me with lying tongues, they encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me. So here the psalmist is saying, I've been the victim of malicious words, lying words, hateful words, attacking words, accusing words. And notice what the psalmist does in response here. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer, to prayer. You see, godly words can overcome wicked words. Now, it doesn't always happen immediately or in the here and now, but there's a power of words to kill and to give life. A wicked heart is going to bring forth accusations, lying, hatred, cursing, murmuring, whining, complaining, gossip, discouraging words, and other kinds of words. Proverbs talks about, for example, the, the problem of too many words. <laughs> too many words. I think I just got a witness there. I'm not the only one in the room with this problem. What does Proverbs 10 say? In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. You talk too much, 
you're going to sin. Which is, by the way, one of the reasons I rely on a whole team of praying people to pray me through days like this. I'm speaking a lot of words today. And we speak a lot of words every day, but I'm speaking a lot today as we're recording eight new Reviver Hearts programs. And I know that in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. That the more I speak, the greater is the potential for me to sin with my tongue. So one of my prayers as I come into a day like this, as I prayed at the outset here, is Lord, let the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. Help them be truthful. Help them to be kind and gentle and restorative and healing and life-giving. It's so easy to say words that will cut and wound without even intending it or without realizing it, which is why we need the filling of Jesus' spirit in our lives. Too many words. Proverbs says in chapter 17, he who has knowledge spares his words. Proverbs 29, do you see a man hasty in his words, too quick to talk? There is more hope for a fool than for him. James 1, let every person be quick to hear slow to speak, and slow to anger. Then there are lying words and different kinds of lying, a lot of different uh, ways that we can lie with exaggeration, with flattery, with slander, gossip, misleading, hypocrisy, guile, broken promises. These are words that can bring death and harm. Impure words. Ephesians 5 talks about this. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. They have no place coming out of the tongues, out of the mouths of the children of God. No filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude talking. It breaks my heart. It grieves me to see how free women are today to speak crudely, roughly, with filthy talk, with foolish talk. And this is why you don't want to fill your mind and your heart with the way people talk on television or in the movies. Um, there's just such a, an overtness, an out there, a saying whatever you think, no filter on mouths. And this is when we sin. We, we sin against God and we sin against others with impure words. Harsh, cutting, biting words. Oh, this is such a visual image in Proverbs 12, verse 18. There's one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. There's one who speaks like the piercings of a sword. You have felt that sword come into your own heart when a mate, a child, a parent, a boss, a colleague, somebody at church said something to you or about you and it got back to you. It was like, oh, it hurt. Wounded me. I was having a conversation with a friend the other day, and I said something. I didn't intend it to cut. I didn't intend it to wound. And I watched my friends. I just watched, like, the, the life come out of their face. I don't know how else to say it. So I said that, and I just said, did that discourage you? And they said, yeah, it did. Um, with our, with a, just a sentence, a phrase, we can deflate and wound hurt. It's when we need to be sensitive to the Spirit and go back and make it right. Make sure the relationship is right. The piercings of a sword. A woman wrote us at the ministry and she illustrated this. She said, and how it's a generational thing many times. She said, my mother constantly abused me verbally as I was growing up. She called me names, accused me of things I had no intent of doing until she suggested it. (laughs) To this day, and she says, parentheses, I will soon be 74, she still haunts me from the grave. She had a very critical spirit. After she died, I realized that her mother had treated her the same way. She made life miserable for our family. Words have been my destruction down through the years. I'm struggling not to be like her, but I find myself making degrading comments about overweight people, dirty people, people with too much makeup, and on and on. I so regret that it has taken me all this time to show me how much I've been like my mother. Harsh words, rough words, cutting words, biting words, all of these, too many words, lying words, impure words, they come out of wicked hearts. They expose what's in our hearts. It comes out. 
You squeeze an orange or a lemon, you squeeze a lemon, what's going to come out? Sour lemon juice. What comes out is a dead giveaway to what's inside. And when those kinds of words come out, they expose our hearts in ways that we don't always want to acknowledge. So what happens if we have a pure heart? Well, our words will give thanks. They will encourage. They will bless. They will strengthen. There'll be words fitly spoken, as Proverbs 25 says, words in due season, words that are well-timed. Listen, there's some things you need to say, but you don't need to say it now. Your husband may need to hear what's on your heart, but he may not need to hear it when he walks in the door after a long, hard day. And you just spew it. I always tend to think I can just, I'll feel better if I just say it. And then you say it and you feel a whole lot worse, right? (laughs) Words that are well-timed, so important. A soft tongue, Proverbs talks about, says can actually break a bone. Now, not in a bad way. You don't want to be breaking people's bones with your words. But a soft word can actually break down hard places in relationships. And we think we got to push it, force it, say it, be louder, be stronger. (laughs) Proverbs talks about the power of a soft answer, to turn away wrath. Pure heart will use words to talk about the Lord. Psalm 71, my mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day. My tongue will talk of your righteous help all the day long. How much of our conversation in the course of a day is about Jesus? Or how little of our conversation. What about at church? Now, I know during the sermon, there's a lot of talk about Jesus, but what about in the aisles before and after the service? What are we talking about? So does that mean we can't talk about the game last night, or we can't talk about the weather, or we can't talk about the kids' school? No, those things are fine, but why do we talk so little about Jesus? If he's the one who fills our vision and our hearts, you'd think it would come out in our conversation. The pure heart will use their tongue to give thanks. Psalm 109, with my mouth, I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng. Use our tongue to share the gospel. Psalm 40, verse 10, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. How about words that affirm and encourage and build others up? Such a powerful way to use our tongue. Ephesians 4, you know this verse, but again, this is one we need to read like, you know, every three hours or so. (laughs) Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only, only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. What does grace do? It enables, it strengthens. Our words are supposed to be good words. Words that fit the occasion, words that are appropriate for the moment, words that build others up, and words that give grace to those who hear. So do your words in your home, in your marriage, in your workplace, do they destroy or do they build up and give grace? By the way, if you continue into the rest of Ephesians 4, you'll see again that these words, these good words, are an expression of a good heart, forgiving heart, loving heart. Again, Proverbs talks about Using our words to build up. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. That's the best antidepressant there is in some cases. It's just an encouraging word. Some of your husbands need some encouraging. Every husband needs encouraging words. Some of your husbands, it's been a long time since they've heard encouraging words come out of your mouth. And so they go into the workplace and they get beat up and They're in this competitive world, and they get beat up there. What happens when they come home? Do they get beat up, or do they get built up? Proverbs 31, verse 26, this virtuous woman, this noble woman, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. I don't know about you, but I want to be a woman whose words are always wise and kind. I'm not there. I'm way far from there. But that's what I aspire to. When I open my mouth 
with our staff, with the people who know me best, with the people inside the four walls of my own home, with when I'm traveling, when I'm meeting strangers. And usually the trouble is not with the strangers. It's not with the guests in our home. It's with the people who live in our home, right? Do we open our mouths with wisdom? Wisdom has a lot to do with timing and with kindness. Proverbs 16 says that pleasant or delightful words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Pleasant, sweet words. What are some of those words? Words like, I appreciate you so much. I'm praying for you. Is there anything I can do for you? Please, thank you. Please forgive me. I was so wrong. I forgive you. It's another sweet, pleasant word. I'm so glad God gave you to me. I love you. How often do those words get spoken from your mouth to your closest friends? I love that verse in the Song of Solomon where the bridegroom says to his bride, your lips drop nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. You think about it. What does honey do? It strengthens that which is weak. And milk strengthens weak bones. Pleasant, sweet words have the power to give strength to your man, to your children, to your parents. Honey and milk are under your tongue. And by the way, it doesn't say her words are like a babbling brook. (laughs) Honey kind of drips slowly, right? And it's when my words become a babbling brook that I'm going to say things I'm going to regret and that are going to cause harm and damage. Honey and milk, words carefully measured, carefully thought through, spoken in love. And nowhere is this thing of pleasant words more important than in the home and nowhere more important than in the marriage. A woman wrote to us and said, Our marriage is falling apart. My husband moved out several months ago. I pray it's not too late to appreciate him with words of encouragement. Ladies, speak the words before it's too late. Why your husband's there. This is why over the years we've issued this 30-day husband encouragement challenge to women. And I see some heads nodding. Many of you have done this. Maybe it's time to do it again. Uh, And if you don't know about that, go to reviveourhearts.com. Pull up the 30-day husband encouragement challenge. Nothing that we have challenged women with has had greater response than that husband encouragement challenge. And let me just read to you some of the response we've received. This one came from a husband. It's a sad one. He says, I wish someone would encourage my wife to take the 30-day challenge. We've been married for 30 years. We argue a lot. And whenever I try to talk and reason with her, she just gets mad and starts yelling. Now I know it takes two to tango. But I just want to tell you from this husband's perspective what he's feeling. He said she spends hours every day on the phone gossiping and telling her friends and family what a sorry husband I am. Please pray for her, that she will stop speaking so badly about me to others, and that she will seek God's advice for our crumbling marriage. I love my wife and had hoped that my marriage would last a lifetime, but she is slowly killing my love for her. And please pray for me, that I would be the husband that God wants me to be. Here's another one from a wife who says, We've been married for two years and our marriage has been rocky. There has been yelling, name-calling, and constant fighting over stupid, small stuff. I know how important it is for a man to feel encouraged. And as a wife, I want to encourage him and make him feel like he has someone in his corner. I'm on day two of the 30-day husband encouragement challenge. And my attitude toward him is already changing. Imagine what it'll be after 30 days. She says, I simply write the verse of the day. We have a little journal we send to you if you're interested in this or you can get it online. I write the verse of the day and a little note pertaining to it on an index card and I slip it in his lunch. I also write encouraging things on the packaging of the stuff in his lunch. This morning, day two, he texted me to let me know that he loved the notes and it was breaking his heart. In just two days, I see us rekindling the relationship we had before all the garbage we allowed between us. Well, this woman wrote and said, I've done a lot of damage with my quick-spoken, thoughtless words. How do I keep from blurting out angry words to people? How do I repair relationships I have damaged? Let me just suggest two things, and then the other resources we've talked about will be helpful. But number one, purpose to honor God with your words. 
I've purposed that my mouth will not transgress, the psalmist says in Psalm 17. I've purposed that my mouth will not transgress. And then how do you do that? Fill your heart with his word. Instead of your words coming out of an evil heart, fill your heart with his holy word. And Psalm 17 says in the next verse, verse 3, I've purposed that my mouth will not transgress. Verse 4, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. His word in you as it comes out will minister grace to the hearers. And then ask him for help. Ask him for help, the Lord. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. And so we have this prayer in Psalm 141. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And Lord, that's my prayer. And I believe it's the prayer of my sisters in this room. She would guard our tongues. And may we speak only words that are true words that help and heal, words that are wise and kind, words that honor Christ and build others up. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.